you want to know what role you're playing, right? So it's hard for me to give it up because there are times where you're like, I need to be a leader right now. Like I need to make people uncomfortable with a high bar, a big vision, not taking no for an answer. Uh, and and I think for, for those of us who are more comfortable, I'll speak for my, as a manager and someone who's facilitating, getting outcomes, I think you have to consciously turn on, put on that hat. Today I chat with Claire Hughes Johnson, who was the CEO of Stripe and wrote this amazing book called Scaling People about how she scaled Stripe, how she and many people scaled Stripe. And um, we chat about five big things today. The first is we chat about her four personal operating principles. And if she were to add one, what would she add? Uh, which is all about listening to the no and being kind of a pusher versus a puller, people who uh, just take so much inbound and don't say no enough. Uh, then we talk about the second thing we talk about is kind of viewing Stripe as an organism and what it was like for her to kind of get in there, start to feel the inbound demand, feel the flywheels occurring around them, and then the need to like actually grow the and build a massive company to kind of respond to those inbound demand and flywheels. Kind of makes me think of like a viral tweet that then you have all this attention. Um, it was like that, but instead the company is like becoming viral and, and what do you do when to, to respond to that. Then we chat about her one piece of advice for founders, which is all about trusting your instincts and moving faster. And then fourth, we chat about what she kind of disagree with the Collison brothers on um, around kind of trusting, you know, a trusting frame versus a paranoia frame and how those are actually um, pretty complementary to each other. And then finally, we chat about how she understands people and, um, you know, what people's, you know, to get people at a gut level and to trust your own gut and how important that is. So it's, it's a great conversation. We really dive into, you know, her book is amazing and gets very tactical. And today we kind of um, understand her more as a philosophical being um, and how that philosophy then um, turns into building and scaling these, these large companies. So with that, I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Claire uh, and thanks everybody. Hello, Reese's Pieces. I'm Reese, the founder of Root, and welcome to The Reese Show. I believe the best way to predict the future is to build it. And so I'm interviewing pioneers on the frontier to understand what the world will look like and the secrets behind how they're building it. These are insights from the frontier. And today, I'm excited to chat with Claire Hughes-Johnson. In one decade, Claire helped Google scale from 2,000 to 50,000 employees. And then in the next decade, as the COO of Stripe, Claire helped them scale from 160 to 7,000 employees. And she wrote an excellent book on all of this called Scaling People, Tactics for Management and Company Building. Claire, thanks for being on the show and welcome. Thank you for having me, Reese. Yeah, excited to dive in. Yeah. And it's kind of um, it's kind of like the theme of the last couple episodes for me here has been like kind of just interviewing badass women <laughs> and like and also interview so you can rename guess, your podcast. <laughs> Reese interviews badass women, you know? <laughs> Hey, I actually think that could be a good direction. I like it. I agree. I agree. I agree. I think it, um, but sometimes I don't interview badass women. So I kind of got to keep it wide and scope. Yeah, you, know? you want to be more inclusive of them. I more, guess. And this is just my current kick, you know? And so, um, but it is amazing for myself and you and the listener to kind of conceptualize. And also the goal here is that like, you know, the frontier becomes reality in this weird way. Um, and, you know, it becomes reality through people. Um, and so, you know, the internet we know today is one of Gmail and Stripe and whatever. Um, and so, but the, those don't just get created. They have to, there's an organization behind all that in an organism that like has many tens of thousands of people that produces that thing. So that's yeah. kind of what we're going to chat about. Um, and I also want to give one other macro framing, which is the book is um, amazing. It's this, you know, chock full of great tactics. It's kind of like, um, it made me think of like atomic habits, but for like company building, you know, oh, or just like- you. Yeah. Do all these things. <laughs> you know? it, it is very tactical. It's very, it just, uh, very tactical. I agree. Which is good, which is good. Um, but I want to share these, um, uh, you know, some of the folks on Goodreads were like, hey, um, I wanted to learn more from a person like you um, instead mm -hmm. of bread and butter stuff, more about strategic thinking, building succession, creatively growing others. And then this other person said, I wish that there had been more injection of Hughes Johnson's own insider philosophies. Um, and so and personal stanzas, empirical, whatever. Um, and so that's kind of what we're going to dive into today is the more kind of um, gushy side. All right. All right. Good. Well, good. Good to get feedback always. So thank you. <laughs> 
<laughs> and by the yeah. way, these are those those are people who still gave it four and five stars on Goodreads. It's still, you know. Well, hey, I guess they want more, but I I don't think I'm signing up for another book. But oh my but god, you no. you can get the more out of me, and then exactly. Then you're, here's your hour podcast. All right, exactly. Great. Um, so I want to start with the um with those two framings in mind. I can I I just love to start with your four like you as a person and your four operating principles, and I'm especially curious like what would your so could you t tell us and listeners what your four operating principles are and then also what your fifth would be if you were to add a fifth one um yeah the four and the first one is really i think my heaviest one but is build self-awareness to build mutual awareness and then say the thing you think you cannot say which became more of a hallmark i think for me later in my career uh distinguish between management and leadership which does get it to some philosophy that I have that may not be the same as others. Um, and then come back to your operating system. And, and that's part of what's in the book is a chapter sort of about building operating systems for companies. Uh, and I started building operating systems for the teams I led when I was at Google and I realized, oh, this kind of replicates up and down. What would I add? I think um, I think I would add listen to the no. Hmm. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons behind that. One is I am, I'm an extremely optimistic person and I'm also a person who really wants to help others. I'm a person who likes to be of service. And so I am optimistic about how much time I have and how fast I can do things. And I am really terrible at saying no. <laughs> Uh, cause when people ask for help, I feel like I want to be of service and I want to, you know, help. And, um, in my working with Claire guide, I even acknowledge this, but I don't say that I've solved it cause I haven't, which is that I say yes too much. And so I had, um, I had a friend who, uh, is a very, I would just say spiritual person, someone who's really grounded and in touch with like inner spirit for lack of a better word very wise. And she said, you need, she said, in your head, there's going to be loud voices and there's going to be quiet voices. And you need to like pause and, th and listen and listen. You're going to hear the loud voice, but listen to the, when the quiet voice comes. And I think for me, I, my loud voice is yes. I like really default to yes. Because I really, I don't think it's FOMO. Sometimes it's FOMO, but I really do. And so I've realized I need to like pause, think about what what is being asked of me and, you know, and really in my inner inner core, do I really think it's a no and I need to say no? So so that's that's been um, a life. That is not something I have yet conquered. But I think, I thank you for pushing me. I need to add that. Listen for the no. Or, I mean, yeah, it's just always good to know. I mean, and I love the, um, I love the kind of internal family systems energy there of like these, your mind is this combination of all these little people that are like, Hey, Hey, Claire, don't forget, like people want your help. Go for it. You know? And that's like, that person is there all the time, but there's right. actually this other person in there. That's like, uh, Claire, I think you already have a lot on your plate. Um, you should probably right. say like, no. Yeah. Who's like, Hey, let's keep some energy for tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you think that this, um, it makes me think of a the pusher polar dynamic um, mm -hmm. that you wrote about in your book. Um, do you want to kind of explain that dynamic and whether this is you saying that you're a uh, polar? Oh, definitely a polar. Uh, the, I, I, you know, I would say that some of the frameworks in the book are going to be familiar to readers, uh, you know, like the urgent uh, versus important framework, things like that. And then the pusher and polar, I think, I think I came up with, but I'm sure there's maybe some academic out there who will counter me, but which is the idea for top talent, that there's one version of top talent. And this is reductive. And I admit that I just want to be clear, but there's one version of top talent who's more like an in your face, like, give me the assignment, give me a very outwardly and inwardly ambitious. And they often get very impatient with you, with their team. They want more, they want faster, they want better. Um, they often want to talk about compensation because they're keeping score, not because they're necessarily obsessed, but, you know, it comes off that way. And then the polar is more of the quietly, you're just like saying very competently, you say, can you take this on for me? And they just like say, oh yes. And then they take it and they add it to some mountain, well, if, you know, that they're of this seemingly unending energy to take on these assignments and like quietly do them, but 
the puller often ends up also quietly suffering uh, and not delegating or not listening to the no. So yes, I definitely am a puller. And, and I even, I'll speak for myself, not all pullers, I even get in this mode that's a bit of a martyr thing, which I don't love. My I had a colleague point this out to me, um, which is I'm sort of resentful of the people around me for not taking on these assignments. Yet I have been the one who took them on and said yes. Uh, but then I sort of want to just like quit, you know, and like throw it down on the table and say, why didn't you help with the, you know, all hands or whatever? And so I've I've really got to watch that side of my my being a puller because I reach a limit and then I kind of boil over. Right. And I think that happens for pullers um, and for pushers in a different way. But I think pushers more likely to hit a wall. Like they've sort of just been pushing so hard. And then, and whereas the puller sort of is quietly, quietly, and then spills over, uh, spills over the wall. Uh, But yes, it is related. As a, as a puller yourself, it, um, and it's funny because I think, Correct me if I'm wrong, but but uh, you know I'm thinking about like um, I was chatting with Malun Yen recently and the Operator Collective, and it's just oh, like great. it's ninety percent of her um, LPs are women, which is amazing, and they're all these women who are just like they actually are like the, it's kind of like emotional the emotional labor of society, and then there's this kind of like polar labor behind all of the like b- the ops behind all the businesses that exist in the world. How gendered do you think it is? I like a percentage of polars in my mind, mm-hmm. it was like. 75, 25, kind of like women to men, but I don't, I don't know. Do you have any instinct on that? Um, I don't, I mean, I don't have data other than anecdotal data. Oh yeah, the, mine's I've, anecdotal, man- anecdotal. I've, I've managed because I've made up this framework Reese, recently. So maybe I'll do a study now. I should. Um, my data is anecdotal. The 75, 25 doesn't sound wrong to me. I mean, I would say that the, the pushers that I have managed or, in, or worked with as colleagues who are women um, have tended to be competitive athletes. Um, and, and I think whatever that is, some kind of correlation there, uh, or causation, I don't know, maybe the competitive athlete turned into the competitive employee. Uh, but, but I think they exist. And, um, and I'm thinking of a couple people right now in the very front of my mind. Um, but, but maybe not quite, not 50 50 for sure. Yeah. yeah. And oh, then yeah, on the and- pullers, I actually have worked with, I actually think the men who are pullers are even more quietly suffering. Mm. Um, and maybe that's because it's like not typical or it's not cool or there's something is something gendered in that. I don't know. But some of the, I mean, I work on a lot of operations teams, like support teams, really detailed, deep process, deep analytical. They're loading you up. And the men I've worked with in those kinds of orgs are real pullers, the, the top talent, and they never complain. Whereas I was explaining to you, I ha- I sometimes hit a wall. I just like start exploding with complaint. And um, I think um, that there's something maybe badly gendered about that where um, I think we, we're working on, well, different cultures are working on this differently. But a lot of my conversation with my husband about raising a son is making sure he understands it's okay to be emotional. Mm-hmm. You know, it's yeah. okay to, to express feelings or say, like when I when I sort of overflow and say, I can't do this anymore, I'm overloaded, you know. But like, I'm really having a feelings moment. And I think sometimes uh, men are less comfortable having a moment like that and saying, 100%. I need help. Dude's you just gotta have feelings too. It makes me think of um, some of my... When the places where I can express my feelings the most is like in COVID times, the smoke times when it was orange day out here. And I just remember, and I just was crying and hitting my, my pillow in my own room, you know, or it's like, that's where I'm allowed to do it, but like not, I, I'm not allowed to do it in public. Right. Um, or but, in the workplace, you know, especially. Yeah. 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 I mean, um, so I, I love that. So schools are built well for boys. Like there's a lot of stuff that gets programmed in because I worry sometimes when we talk about things being gendered, we're judging things. It's a good or a bad thing. And I think it's sort of just a thing. And we really have to study why it happens and how much of it is some natural predisposition versus just some programming. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's it's some weird combination of both, but, but TLDR, um, listen to the no. Um, it reminds me, think it makes me think of, I just wrote this piece on you are allowed, you have permission, you know, to tell yourself you have permission to say no, et cetera. Um, so that's great. And then if you were to take one away, which of the three would you take away or which of the four, sorry, would you take away? Oh gosh. You're really, (laughs) 
I don't, well, I don't, I guess I would, oh gosh, I'm really struggling. I, I think um, it depends on the context. I nice. think that distinguish between management and leadership is um, more of a way of me expressing a philosophy than it is something I do constantly. Um, right. If that, you know, so it's, it's a little bit less of an operating principle and more of a principle principle. Like I'm, I can operate without that principle. Um, but I do think there are moments and I'm sure your listeners could relate where you want to know what role you're playing. Right. So it's hard for me to give it up because there are times where you're like, I need to be a leader right now. Like I need to make people uncomfortable with a high bar, a big vision, not taking no for an answer. Uh, and, and I think for, for those of us who are more comfortable, I'll speak for my, as a manager and someone who's facilitating getting outcomes, I think you have to consciously turn on, put on that hat. So I'd have trouble, but I'll give it up if I have to. I will. Okay. You're forced to now you've given it up. You've given up a uh, leader management and you now have listened to the no, 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 no. You, you have your own person. Your I love and- your editing process, Reese. No, you know what I like is it's very much about a self-assessment by me. And then you're just <laughs> yeah. playing back to me, which I appreciate. And I just, all I do is replay the tape. Um, the, um, so let's go to back to a higher level though. So you as a person, these amazing operating principles, and by the way, for listeners, Having operating principles is great. Having how to work with me manual is great. Uh, Claire has that too. And that's worth just Googling like um, how to work with Claire. Um, on the organizational side, let's talk about Google and Stripe and, and startups. Um, so I kind of want to start at a high level with scaling Stripe. Yeah. Um, how do you conceptualize? So, so we have this organism um, that brings payments infrastructure into reality. This organism has a mission, it has a business model, has yeah. people, it has teams, um, and that thing is creating value for the world and capturing some of it. How do you kind of like conceptualize of that organism and its growth into the world? Yeah, I mean, I think that it was helpful to be at Google, not as an executive, but as someone sort of rising through the ranks watching Google go from about 1,800, as you said, to over 50,000 people. Um, And yeah, it doesn't just materialize. Like you have to put in the work and there's people doing a lot of intentional things. And then there's just flywheels that are happening that you're responding to that create, you realize, oh, I need 10 more bodies because the flywheel just got bigger, you know? And I think that um, having experienced that coming into Stripe, it was easier for me to see the forces that were already, you know, it was 160 people, but the inbound, I mean, I'm going to be very specific here, like the inbound demand from customers, we had to turn off the contact sales link in my first week, which was not a decision you want to be making. Um, But it was worse because you could, we couldn't get back to customer. You couldn't get back to a prospect who wanted to use the product. So it's better to like not disappoint them was the call. And then it was like, let's get organized so we can, but, you know, looking at that inbound demand, looking at the support demand too, by the way, the product, you know, always needs work. And then um, thinking about the functions that need to exist to support a company that's increasingly in a regulated space, which is, you know, payments. You know, if you really want to do interesting, creative things, you need to be under regimes, both from your partners, like the credit card, you know, companies, but also financial partners but and banks, but also uh, governments increasingly. So, but that requires other functions and abilities because you have to, you know, in fact, be ready for someone. The th- One of my favorite things at Stripe is we have conference rooms designated as rooms that if some a regulator shows up, this is their workspace, they can show up unannounced to audit us. And we have an available space, but it is also separated because we're trying to do our job. We're like, you can sit in this conference room on the first floor and do your whatever you need anyway. But um, so when I came into Stripe, it felt less unknown and not maybe not as intimidating it felt like a big jobs to be done assessment. And I just looked at, I mean, I just took an audit and I, I got some smart person who was sort of working in finance, barely analytics kind of person. And I said, let's do a bottoms up, tops down assessment of how big we should be. Uh, and that, and, and look at the data, just say, you know, what, what do teams think they need? What do we see in the data that they need? Uh, what is the trajectory of the revenue of the customer base growth? And the company was a lot smaller than it should have been. (laughs) And then you have to sort of get everyone psychologically their head around that, which is 
this really amazing, hardworking, very talented group of individuals and founders who really like, love each other and are like, isn't this great? We're a couple hundred people and it's so fun. And I was like, but, but also you're burning out. You're like, yes, fun, but, uh, and we are missing this entire function, for example, or we need um, to start, you know, if we want to build another product, we can't do it with the people we have um, or another country at another country. So it's sort of, you get in this, so many founders say to me, I want to be really intentional about, you know, how I grow. And, and I salute that, but I will tell you, it's suddenly a bit of a tornado. And are, is, are you going to intentionally then choose not to grow when every fiber around you is like, grow, grow, grow. And some may choose to, but you know, you want to, you have a mission, you built a product to get used. You're going to end up needing to to do it and you're going to do it faster than you if you if you've got that kind of a good problem to have you're going to end up doing faster than you expected yeah i love um, that i think it makes me think of um it also makes me think of kids and how people i don't have kids but you know i'm 31 yes, and a bunch of my so friends true. are starting to have kids right <laughs> everybody's staying their whole life they're like no kids no kids no kids and then it turns on the, and then everybody's trying to have a kid um and it's really hard to have the kid and so it's like people are living their life no growth, no growth, no growth. They're trying to find PM Fit, trying to find, and then finally it happens. Um, and then they're like, oh my God, it's, I guess we're trying to make this kid happen. And now we have a kid and it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's every, you know, that everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face <laughs> is, yeah. is basically parenting. You're like, oh, I'm going to just be, you know, super present, always really doing their brain development exercises. <laughs> and you get a kid and you're like, here, have some Cheerios. Like, what? shut up, yeah. shut up and have some Cheerios, you know, it, 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 it's totally reality smacks you right in the face uh, yeah. as a parent. Yeah, that's funny. I guess, yeah, there's two ways in which it's similar. One is in the way in which, yeah, reality, once you have the kid, reality smacks you in the face and um it's like, oh my God, you're just trying to, you're not, you're not playing Picasso or whatever, playing yeah. Mozart. Um, And then the <laughs> other piece and the thing that I was kind of saying was that there's a, it's just a funny thing where it's like, so, you know, um, humans, their lives can be defined as no kids, no kids, birth control, condoms, et cetera. And then you're like, okay, now you're with your partner. You want to have stuff. And then you're like, okay, now let's turn it on. Let's like actually try to make this baby. And, and then it can be hard and blah, blah, blah. And you have to do yeah. IVF and all stuff. And so it, um, it just makes me think of like living your life as like pre PMF and like pre, you don't, you're just trying to find that product market fit. And then finally it turns on. You're like, no, the like the feedback loops, you, I don't know. It's like, you have to change your whole priors about the situation. You, well, someone said to me that the, the most fascinating part of having a child is there's nothing that he had ever experienced in his life that flipped his worldview in like a minute. Like you're not a parent and then you're suddenly a parent and everything is different. And, and so that is a little bit of like pre pri I mean, pr the problem with product market fit is sometimes t companies don't realize they've quite gotten it. So it's not a minute. It might be a few months, but I think that, that, that worldview flip of, and really what my book is a lot about Reese is it's one thing to go and get that PMF and get traction and start to operate with that traction. But all of a sudden you turn around and then you've got to build a company. And that's a very different, some similar skills to product development, but some not. And I think, talk about smacking you in the face. You've just done all this work to get to a point that you've built something that people want and they're even maybe paying for, and it's, it's flying off the shelf. And then you're looking around and it's like a tire fire <laughs> behind you. And you're like, I have to now build a company. And I didn't even plan to do that. Uh, it's it's I think it's a really probably a very isolating experience because everyone is celebrating and you're probably just faced with another mountain. <laughs> totally. Nothing but mountains. So let's, let's talk about that for a second, which is, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're, you are now in an advisor role with Stripe and less mm -hmm. just a COO yeah. energy. And so you're helping various founders and companies kind of do to scale. And, yeah. and, and so what, um, what is like the one thing that most of them are doing wrong? <laughs> Or like what um, piece of, yeah. What are they doing wrong? You know, I think that I'm going to say this carefully, Reese, but nice. if there's a continuum of a founder who is um, really very sure of themselves, 
and a little bit in the worldview, like I'm the founder and I have to know the answer and I'm going to say this is the way, like the Mandalorian founder. And then on the other end of the continuum are people who are constantly wondering, thinking, I really want to be intentional. I want to be thoughtful. I want to listen. I want to call others for advice. I don't want to judge quickly. I don't want to declare this is the way too soon, too quickly, right? If that's a continuum, so the more of the, 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 the thoughtful introvert versus the sort of this is the way extrovert possibly, um, most of the founders I work with are on the thoughtful introvert side, and that may not be an accident. Uh, because I don't love a dynamic because I'm a learner. I'm like, there's so many things we just don't know. And I worry about the founders who who are too definitive about what they want and what they think needs to happen and the way things are going to run. Though I've certainly seen some be quite successful because they really have a vision. I mean, I think you could say Steve Jobs had elements of this where they're like, this is the way it's going to be. And I don't care if you don't like it. Uh, and I'm going to be pretty hard on you until you do it the way I want you to do it right? But that's not my vibe. So I tend, so when you ask me what are founders, so so that's my preface to saying, what are founders uh, struggling with? The more thoughtful, potentially slightly more introverted, but really it's more that they're, they're learning and thinking and really trying to do the right thing are um, often have good instincts and they're not confident enough in those instincts and they end up sort of overthinking or or cycling, right? And that can be thrashy for an organization. But it's, I mean, it's easy for me to say this after 30 years of working to say like, I recognize patterns. I'm pretty confident when I see a certain talent issue. I'm pretty confident when I see that a team isn't operating well. Um, and then we're talking about someone who may be, you know, pretty early in their life, let alone their career. And they're, they need people around them who can validate their instincts. So a lot of my founder conversations end with me saying, well, you knew what you needed to do. All you did is talk it out with me and have me validate it. Um, it's very rare, Reese, that I'm like, oh, you're doing it wrong. Like, you know what I mean? Like they know a lot. I mean, a lot. I mean, I guess that would be my optimistic note for everyone is in you, you know, but don't take too long to try to validate it because it starts to hurt people. Like it's not, that actually starts to be a very bad behavior. Yeah. I love that. I think it's, um, yeah, it makes me think of, um, a bunch of things. A is like this scout mindset. Um, this good book by Julia Galef, which is about how actually the scout mindset's really good. You don't necessarily want to have always a Steve Jobs thing. You want to be, have uncertainty. You want to yes. be game for whatever you want to have, you know, whatever Patrick calls energy where it's like, I don't know what, what is the, um, you know, topological disagreement space here. It's like, you know, um, and so, um, you want that and, yes. but, and then, but you are maybe lacking, especially the folks that you're working with, or maybe it makes me think I did some assertiveness training for myself at one point, did you? Um, which yeah. is pretty helpful. It also makes me think of the, um, I gave this talk recently about at this a lightning talk, a very small talk on um, motivational interviewing and NVC as mm -hmm. things that coaches like yourself um, and, and I run this little school should do with people, which is, and motivational interviewing is all you're saying is just like it's self-efficacy and it's belief. You're just like, you already got this. And then the NVC is just for, it'd be like, oh, this sounds scary, but you have this, you know, and you don't really do anything. <laughs> yeah. No, I feel like a lot of my coaching, I thank you for putting uh, vocabulary to it. I do a lot of motivational interviewing coaching where I just say, well, what do you think you should do? Hmm. Well, that sounds, and then, you know, we're tweaking, <laughs> you know me, I like to be tactical. So then uh -huh. I say, okay, so what are you exactly going to say? Like when you got to mm -hmm. do this hard thing that you realize you have to do, uh, the other thing I find myself doing is decoupling decisions. People tend to combine, like they're making assumptions. Um, this isn't so much of a, well, this is a founder who is making a decision. And I found that he was combining a decision about his company direction with kind of a hiring decision, let's say. And, and it, I was like, well, you're making a big assumption about your company direction, which is and I think trying to convince yourself that this is the right hire. And I said, if you just decoupled, would you tell me that's your company direction for sure? Right. Or where did you get so entranced by this candidate that you're, and, and that I think helped 
you know, you just get slight, you get a little bit emotionally attached sometimes to a direction you're headed, either with a candidate or a product idea. And you need to sort of say, well, actually, I'm making one decision and then another one. Uh, and if I make them together, I might make a different set of decisions than I intended to. Yep. Yep. I love that. I think. And so if you're a founder listening to this, um, you can just have Claire on your shoulder saying, uh, I believe in you and you're doing the right thing, but act, but you got to kind of move quickly and make decisions and like be more assertive here. Uh, yeah. So. You got to be more confident. You got to be more confident. Be more that's confident. Right. Exactly. By the way, Claire um, is on my shoulder is something that's been repeated to me by many people who work with me. So uh, I guess I'll take that as my next. Probably helpful. I, I got to put that on LinkedIn. Yes, exactly. You have your little shoulder, shoulder uh, I'll, LLM. I'll, yeah, I'll be your, you know, macaw. I don't know your parrot or your macaw. Exactly, angel demon and Claire. Angel demon um, and parrot. <laughs> um, so I have a question for you about. I want to ask, like, so there are there are many folks who have written good things about. Um, how to build companies, and um, one of, and some of them were built inside Stripe, aka I'm thinking of Brie Wolfson and um, Eek. I've never met Eek, but is that, how Eka, is that her name? Eka, 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 yeah. Eka, um, yes. and Eka who are building High Constellate, and yeah. um, Brie built Kool Aid Factory in the yeah. past. And Kool Aid Factory, I kind of think of Kool Aid Factory as like a cool design, um, but more high level and vibey. And yours is like the double click on a lot of those um, ideas. What would you say for a lot of the folks, and maybe with Brie as an um, example or someone like that, what do you think you most disagree with other um, kind of people who think about company building on? I don't know that Brie and I, from what I've seen of Kool-Aid Factory, and certainly I know her well, and I hired, yeah. hired her at Stripe, yeah. so, um, and Aiken and I worked closely together. I'm not sure that we have areas we disagree on. Um, I think, uh, so, so I, that's hard for me. I have looked at the stuff and I think a lot of it, as you said, is the more cool vibey. I love all the references she puts in Kool-Aid Factory and the zines. Like here's how this company did it. Here's how this company did it, which I, why I love that is it's easy to sort of conceptually describe a thing, but then you're like, how do I, and that's why scaling people, you're right. Is a click into me conceptually describing things and then showing examples just from my life, you know, and I think there are other examples. And, and I guess that's what I would say is like, again, I don't love the my way or the highway people. The people are like, this is the way, you know, that's just not. Um, but I think my biggest disagreement, um, if I think about various management and business books yeah. I've read and, and maybe philosophical Reese, and even by the way, with at least one of the Stripe founders, I, um, a lot about what I believe in, in the book is that this investment in your team, in your people, in the operating structures is creating better outcomes, but a lot of these are inputs, right? Uh, and the outcomes are much later and I don't probably obsess as much about observability and monitoring of, you know, there's sort of like a theory of the case, like if we do these things, and, and it's a it's basically where strategy hits operating, right? Which is like, okay, we have this theory of the case that this is the, the, the right direction to go. And then I'm trying to create conditions and environment where the team is going to outperform if they didn't have those conditions and environments. But you're assuming that you have the right theory of the case, that you have the right strategy and the right direction. And for me, who's led in been more in operational roles, that's... um. I'm not saying that's a given, but it's a little more straightforward. Like I know how to improve a support experience. I know how to build a sales team and have them, you know, perform uh, marketing measure. Not all of marketing is measurable as we talk about, but you know, there's measurable parts of marketing. Um, and I think in product development and even in company strategy, there's like fairly big decisions and that you want to be monitoring and more visibility but I think that that turns into two schools of management book, which actually are not necessarily in opposition, but are viewed that way, which is the measuring, monitoring. These are my principles. Follow these. And, and they're a little distrustful, I'm just going to say, whereas mine is a little more, well, build the right conditions and environment, set the goals, but like let people align themselves and you'll see the outcomes will be better, right? But it's a little more trusting. 
And so I think there's the distrustful, I, I don't, this sounds negative, but I don't think distrust is a bad thing because I think a, a healthy paranoia is is needed. But that is where I think I'm not always on the same page, but I want to really acknowledge that I think it's because I haven't been a CEO and I haven't had the burden of the entire, I mean, I'm on a bunch of boards now and I really feel it, which is like, we're making decisions that are more like, not decisions, we're not making them, by the way, the CEO, the executive team's talking to us. And we're meant to be the people who say, well, five years from now, is this going to feel like the right theory of the case, right? And it's a very different conversation. And you really have to think, how am I going to monitor that? How am I going to not trust that enough that if we got this bet wrong, we have a way to get out? And, And so I think there's a different version of my book that is much more in that direction. You're nodding, so I hope that I've been clear, but I, I don't, so I don't disagree with that version of my, of management, but I don't write about it, right? Like, like, like I, because it's very different than how I'm wired. Yeah, I think that makes sense. So what I'm hearing is that there are kind of, to some extent, what, you know, one frame on this could be, um, th- there's a classic frame, which is culture eats strategy for breakfast. Yep. There's a different frame, which yeah. you said earlier, kind of, which is that feedback loops um, eat yes. strategy for breakfast, eat intentionality for breakfast. Yeah. There's this frame here, which is that um, something, again, like culture eats metrics for breakfast or something where it's like, hey, the upstream thing is that yeah. you we build a great culture. We have a good mission. We have these five long-term goals. We have the right values. And it'll all kind of work out. And the dashboards will show good and bad things, but we'll like get to the right place. Is that versus a different perspective, which is more like, no, we got to make sure we cross our T's and dot our I's here. And especially we got to make sure that like everybody's actually, um, al- that everybody's actually aligned. And that, it, it, or like, is that right? Or how? I think it's actually, I think you were getting there with, I think mine is a little bit more culture eat strategy for breakfast and right conditions, right general direction. You're going to get better outcomes. Whereas, because you're going to build the structures in within which people operate and then you're going to trust them. Whereas I think the feedback loops uh, eat, well, eat performance for breakfast, but it's basically, I don't trust that we are correct. All the, you know, and I think that a lot of, I mean, p- founders are rightly sort of paranoid. Like I don't trust that the, you know, is the customer experience still excellent? Is the product working? Is, you know, have we invested in security enough? Have we, you know, there's a certain paranoia and, and the way you assuage your paranoia is you get more feedback, you get more observability, more data, more loops, and those don't feel particularly trustful. But, and, and I would say that I'm less of that school, but I've certainly learned a lot about that school. In, in fact, at Stripe, where we kind of had a mashup of mine and, and, and the other one. And I think that do, being too far in one or the other camp is not great, probably. You want that complementarity. But when I read certain articles or books, I feel like I'm reacting to this. Like, it's all about, you know, I'm more of a trust but verify person. And it's all like verify. <laughs> Just verify. <laughs> totally. Yeah, that's funny. It, um, great. Yeah, so exactly. So if you're building a company, it kind of makes me think of, you know, the classic thing when people, it's like, you need to have a builder and you need to have a seller. You need to have, yes. you know, the Wozniak and you need to have the Steve yes. Jobs, but you also need to have, and, and there's some kind of correlation here, but you also need to have a paranoid person and yes. a, an optimistic person. You need yes. to have a yes person and a no person. And so it's this like, got to have that. And a lot about my talk in the book about diversity is this type of diversity. That complementarity of work style and, and orient, just personal orientation is not just like a nice to have to have a high performing company or team. It's like pretty mandatory, I think, especially if you're going to get real escape velocity, is to have people who are counterweights and, and by the way, who and then who have mutual respect for each other. Like, I'll be the first person if someone in a meeting is like, I don't even think you I don't think that's true. Like, how do we know that's true? And, you know, I have to pause and say, okay, that's fair. That's fair. Like, when was the last time we looked at that data? (laughs) You know, Uh, and I've I've come to, I used to resent, I used to, those people used to sort of make me a little defensive because it felt like friction and it felt like negativity. And now I'm, I welcome it. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm the president of a board for a school and we have a couple of members who are kind of like engineer, they're very disruptive, but I feel like they push, they push everyone else because they'll be like, no, no, no. I didn't see any data to validate that comment. 
<laughs> totally, totally, totally. And you're like, come on, can't we just trust each other here? Yeah, um, right. um, cool. So that, that all makes sense. And I want to transition now to, so we chat about you as a person. We know you're four plus or minus one um, operating principles. Then there's the organizations, these um, entities that are existing in a uh, pre-growth, post-growth, pre-PMF, post-PNF environment, and who need to be in general, need to be more assertive, more kind of yeah. forthcoming. Um, and and because the feedback loops are around them, they need to just kind of like, um, they trust their instincts and go. And and so now what I want to do is I want to chat about your understandings of people. Um, and I think- By the way, trust about- your instincts and go, but also put foundations, put, I feel like I want to hold up my book. Remember, you need to start putting structure in place as you go. <laughs> but anyway- no, no, totally, totally. Yeah, yeah. That uh, just a pure vibe play of like, yo, y'all, we gotta do this thing. No, 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 no. All the you need to have the house. You know, you need to have yeah, the full you need to foundation. Start investing in the team and the structures as you yeah. as you start going because you are gonna grow. Uh, yeah, once yeah, you exactly. Because when you grow, if you can't you can't grow willy nilly, you you have to. Um, yeah, yeah. It makes me think you have to Ryan. build replicating structures, or else you're gonna fall over because you're gonna re you're gonna be redeciding and inventing things on how to do things which is when yep. you really want to be doing is doing all the feedback loops. Like we just talked about more on the strategy, on the theory of the case, on the product performance, and you want the operating loops to, to start to run themselves. Yeah. And I love the, the frame of um, replicating structures, um, yes. you know, yeah, replicating clarity, replicating whatever. And that's what stuff like mission and values do is it just kind of like replicates that exactly. meme space through, exactly. the, through the org. Um, so, so I want to ask about people um, here for a second. And I think this might be a thing that, if I imagine you and I as people, and I don't know for you very well, and you don't know me very well, but if I think that for me, I'm very, I'm very interested in people, you know, and I think you're more interested in like the process, you know, um, and so, but you're also very interested in people. You're very am, uh, people person. You're very interested in people. Um, I, I'm just not at all interested in process, no. <laughs> but um, and 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 this is back to your one of your operating principles about building self awareness to build mutual awareness. So you obviously are very into this. And there's this great um Graham Duncan piece on like what's going on here with this here human um. And he conceptualizes it as understanding someone's transcript with reality. Um, and so how do you go about understanding people's transcripts with reality? How do you understand people? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, you you shared this piece with me, and I'd love for you to say a little more about it, because I, I do think it's fascinating. And I think what the piece, what Graham Duncan's piece does is... Um, what I try to do in some of my book, which is these things that are sort of abstract and unconscious or behind closed doors at the very least, or not voiced, you know, you try to make these implicit things explicit. It's very hard to describe. How do I read a room? How do I read a human? Uh, and, and, and I think that a lot of my, I am process oriented. I don't know. I was in a, I was in this conference yesterday where someone said luck is when preparation meets opportunity and I feel like for me, I'm I'm execution to me is when process meets humans, but the humans have to be as understood because the process doesn't actually do the work, you know. And I think um, I, I think it's fascinating. I mean, I don't know what what your big takeaway from the Graham Duncan piece is. If you want to share it, I'll react to it. But I'm happy yeah. to talk about my version of of, of yeah. yeah. And I think yeah, it's a good question. I, I mean, I guess that the um. One of the takeaways from his piece is that a uh, one should have a um, a multi framework way to understand people, and that part of understanding people is that you got to be taking as input MBTI, you have to taking yeah. as input Big Five, you have to take as input yeah. pusher versus polar, you have to take as input. You had a you had a good one in your book about um, it was a circle. Well, it, oh yeah, um, the, the, so it's it's basically all of these are like. Are you more extroverted or introverted? Are you more, oh, it's actually extroverted or introverted. Are you more task or people oriented? And then there's sort of quadrants of, are you more of a director, an analyzer, a promoter, a collaborator? Those are names I came up with. But yes, that is a to- that is a framework. It's a framework and you're right. It's not the whole ball game. It's, it's more of a work style orientation framework. Do you yeah, tend to be or- oriented to, toward, you know, extroversion, which usually involves, and and people orientation, which creates someone who's very good at getting people together and moving like sales leaders, right? Yes, that is one framework. So the idea is there's these multi-level frameworks, and then you're you're sort of taking the humans and putting them through your frameworks. Exactly. Exactly. And that's that's one of the key. Yeah. 
the thing that I thought that I think that is true. And I think that I probably have more frameworks now than I certainly did in my early life and career. I also think, I don't know if you've read, and I don't know if Graham Duncan gets into this there. We are animals, right? There is something animalistic in, in intuition and instinct about other animals. And so I think the challenge of a lot of these frameworks is it's hard to create a framework for why does your hair stand on end? Like, or why do you suddenly not feel like you trust someone? Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes that's very biased. You don't trust someone because you're full of bias that is incorrect. But sometimes you don't trust someone because you are under threat. And uh, I think that is, I, I, I read about a study that is, I'm going to like butcher the description of this, but it was essentially um, this research experiment where they were flipping, and this is just like that your body knows something before your brain knows it. They were fri- flipping cards uh, and basically anytime there was a red card, there was a little shock to the person. And then they were measuring their body, uh, like their temperature, their heart rate, uh, and maybe even their like adrenaline. Anyway, and the point is, before the brain knew there was a red card, the body was reacting, was what they figured out. And I really think that we often know something in our body before we intellectually understand it. Um, so sometimes a lot of these frameworks are us trying to intellectualize the stuff that is our intuition. Uh, and that's why it's hard to talk about, you know, how do I know if this is, is a good hire? You know, like, because you do really need to think on a number of dimensions, but you also need to get an, I, I think, get an instinct. And I think I've been so trained to avoid being biased that sometimes I've, almost taken, you know, been too, too likely to say, oh yeah, this is a good human. <laughs> totally. uh, it, is, it is funny when, when someone, so, so yeah, kind of like a body keeps the score framework or like yeah. an intuition gut first. And I think that that is a really smart, I learned, yeah, again, the thing I've learned in my life is yeah, just, you got to trust your gut. Like in the end, you can, it's good to try to understand people and to have shared languages for understanding people. But like in the end, if you're like, okay, even though this person was like scored a 92 out of 100 on the Rubik or whatever, like I'm just not feeling it. And that's okay. You know, and that's, yeah. that's totally, you may, yeah. you shouldn't marry that person. Um, so I want to, <laughs> as we get into rep, uh, as we get into um, uh, uh, wrap up mode here, I want to ask um, two final questions. One is, um, yeah, what advice um, do you have for ambitious young people? Um, what advice do I have for ambitious young people? You know, it actually goes back to my founder advice. Like, I think that, um, when you're younger, it is extremely tempting and normal to be caught up in the zeitgeist. What is the best school? What is the best job to get out of school? Like every, it seems like, cause I do work with a lot of younger people, like whatever the hot career, like there's a new hotness every few years, like it's product management, it's VC. It used to be consulting and banking when I was in college, uh, you know, and, and sometimes for some people that's still and I think that it is very easy to be caught up in a group think of your social circle um, and even your parental circle, you know. And what I, I can't emphasize enough is, I mean, it was really self-actualization, which is you have confidence in who you are, really focus on what you know about yourself. It is not what other people want. What you know, your passions are not other people's passions. Your interests are not other people. Your skills are very different than the other people. And isn't it weird that you all want the same job? But no, like, you know, just just for a second, just go back to first principles, right? If you took a group of 50 people, would it make sense that they would all have this, want the same and do well in the same job? No, you intellectually know that. Yet you end up thinking you want that thing. By the way, the other that, that thing could also be, I want to live in the suburbs or I want, you know, like really know thyself. And I think the earlier you start keeping a record for yourself of what do I know? What gives me energy? Uh, what am I inter- What am I curious about? What am I interested in? When am I happiest? When am I not happy? Like literally, like just a self record of, um, and I mean, I think the best thing I did in my early life was not do what everyone else was doing. Uh, and 
And that takes a certain amount of, you know, appetite for risk, I guess, but personal self-awareness, build the self-awareness um, is my advice. And, and you will trust yourself, uh, trust yourself. Yeah, that's great. I think there's a, um, it know thyself. And then also it makes me think of, and I just had this issue for myself last year, um, where I was comparing myself to others. I was out there in the world oh, and I'm 31 and my friends are having kids and I don't even have a girlfriend and blah, blah. And it's like, look, bro. And and I was telling with my executive coach, he was like, he was like, you're comparing a lot, you know? And when you compare, you despair, you know? And it was, and it's so true. And so for me, the helpful thing was also to instead to track my own path, because you're going to naturally compare, instead compare yourself against your own path. Where do you want to be? Yes. Um, and then it, it'll all work out. Um, yes. Okay. So, yes. I love so, when you compare, you despair. I know. There's a little, I'm a, yeah, I'm a, med, I'm a, I love mimetic distillations of random crap. So that is one of them. Um, okay. Let's finish up with some overrated, underrated. Um, the first thing that I want to ask you is, do you think personality assessments are overrated or underrated? Oh, sorry. And to, and to be clear, you'll say whether it's overrated, underrated, and uh, a one sentence on why. Yeah. Underrated, because I think although they're not necessarily an accurate thing always, they are a conversation starter about you knowing yourself. Yeah. Boom. Love it. Um, what about uh, understanding how to give people feedback? Is that overrated or underrated? I feel like this is underrated. Like, I, I, I it's not that hard, but people can't do it. I don't. Yeah. It, it's so weird to me. <laughs> totally. Um, yeah. And you have a funny thing like that in the book where you just kind of got, kind of got popped out into the world as a person who just said what you think. And, um, well, right? no, I, well, oh, no. I, I think I always was comfortable sort of speaking my mind from pretty early on. <laughs> I wasn't always good at giving feedback to individuals, right? One mm. thing to give feedback about, you know, did I like the book uh, in class? Another thing to, to give feedback to people. Uh, especially hard feedback that yes. I really had to practice and I had yep. to fall on my face a few times. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, um, that is a good skill to practice everybody. Um, yep. and it does take practice. Um, what about references when hiring? Is that overrated or underrated? In the way that it is done today, mostly overrated, but I do talk in the, I think there's a way to do it properly or with more depth and inquiry and curiosity, but you have to stop making it a rubber stamp. Like if you've already basically made the job offer and you do a reference, like that's not a real reference. Yep. Love it. Um, and, and one other side note about the Graham Duncan piece is he talks about the real power becomes when he can just take his perspective on someone um, from a hiring perspective against and treat him as at a table against all those other people. So that's yes. um, the most yeah. positive form of it, perhaps. Um, what about uh, keeping a high bar for hiring? Is that overrated or underrated? Underrated. Um if there's any mistakes I've made in my career, it's because I let my bar slip. Yep. Yep. That is kind of the funny. It's like you can either, if you want to make a great organization, you could either read Claire's book, it's 600 pages. It's got all this great information, blah, blah, blah. Or you could just like only hire like really, 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 really good people. <laughs> I don't know about your marketing campaign. By the way, it's not quite 500 pages. I, I actually think though, you've seen this, you can have a team of all stars who loses. Yeah. So I actually think you have to hire great people and <laughs> No, totally. And execution is 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 as you said, execution is process and people. And so and you also you need to know how to hire the good people. So there's you all need kinds to of stuff. Organize all that great talent. But yeah, believe yeah, me, yeah. everything is a thousand times easier if you have great talent. Yeah, yeah. Or yeah. more than a thousand. Uh, beautiful. Um, well, um, with that, we are at time. Thank you so much for coming on today, Claire. And for folks who are listening, um, A, definitely check out the book. It really is yeah, I think Atomic Habits for Organization Building is a way to think about it. Um, if you just Google scaling people um, or press.stripe.com slash scaling hyphen people. Um, also, if you want to check out Claire online, she's on Twitter at C Hughes Johnson um, on Twitter. Uh, yeah, Claire, do you want to say anything else to my the listeners today? No, I really thank you, Reese, for this very stimulating conversation. And for everyone on the frontier, you are probably those people who know thyself. So good job. You're starting in the right place. Starting in the right place. And once you experience PM Fit, um, hit up Claire. (laughs) Or before, really anytime. Um. (laughs) Thanks so much for listening today. If you like the show, please give us a five-star podcast review or subscribe on YouTube. 
And if you'd like to chat about this episode with a community of amazing, smart, ambitious, divergent people, come on by and join our Discord. You can find it at root.co. That's R-O-O-T-E dot co. And then finally, if you'd like to contribute to these ideas being shared more widely in society, you can support the podcast production team at patreon.com slash Reese Lindmark. That's patreon.com slash R-H-Y-S-L-I-N-D-M-A-R-K. Thanks, and see you here for the next episode. Bye.